was the conversations we've been having at, at lunch, and, and it has to do with Ezekiel. And it's Ezekiel 8 and 9. And a um, little background on Ezekiel 8 and 9 as far as I, uh, my experience with it is that I've always heard it growing up as a, as a child in the church. And it's something that I've always believed it, but I never looked into it. You know, I read it and, and uh, I didn't really think much of it until, until recently God put it in my heart that this is what I have to talk about. And um, we're going to look at Ezekiel 9, the sealing and the slaughter. The slaughter. And the question that arises is, the sealing and slaughter recorded in Ezekiel 9, is it a literal event that will take place? Right? So, that being said, we're going to look at Ezekiel 9 very quickly. And I want to start with this, you know, with uh, Ezekiel does anybody know where Ezekiel was uh, uh, when he wrote this and when he went into vision? Where was Ezekiel exiled at? In he was in Babylon, right? He was in Babylon. And uh, we read, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat, where? In mine house. And the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. So where was Ezekiel? And who was in front of him? The elders, right? And being in front of witnesses, what did Ezekiel go into? Into vision. Does anybody remember of anybody else in recent history that has gone through very similar things? Alan White. Alan White. It was the exact same thing. And I had put up a lot of scriptures, and, but I took them off. Now, in preparing this lesson or this study... It's, I had so much information, I took so much out, put some more back in, took some out. I was just going back and forth, and, and I hope that whatever I share with you today would be enough to cause you to at least understand and get a glimpse of what this is all about. But going on, he said, Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as of the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, Fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And who was he describing? Christ. Son of God, right? Amen. Jesus, right? Now, if we want to really understand this study today, I have a recommendation. And Mary shared with me a video. So I watched it yesterday. I watched it yesterday. And it's uh, Biblical 911 from Nader Mansour, right? I recommend you go home and watch it. And then if you could, as soon as Tom uploads this, watch this study again today. Because what we're going to study today picks up where Nader left off. Very, very good study from Nader. But... We read Ezekiel 8.3, and he put forth the form of a hand, and he took me by the lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. So he went from Babylon to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate, and looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. And Nader pretty much focuses on this verse. And... So, I want to read something to you, and this is from the Spirit of Prophecy, and it's glorious revelations during the darkest days, and I truly believe we are in some really serious, dark days in this country. She says, all who serve God with purity of soul will know that he is jealous that his honor should be preserved. Many of the most glorious revelations recorded in the Bible were made by the Lord in the darkest days of the church history. The Lord has given these revelations of his glory in order that men may be deeply impressed regarding the sacredness of his service. Impressions have been made that should bear with solemn force on the mind, showing that God is God. Not this triune and not this, uh, um, this imagery that they have brought 
into the sanctuary. And that he has not lost his glory. He requires the utmost fidelity. In other words, uh, uh, when you think of fidelity, what do you think of? Faithfulness. Right? In his service today, the impressions must be left on human minds that the Lord God is holy and that he will vindicate his glory. Do you think I have seen so many coming to this truth about God and when they come to it, they do not let it go. It's, it's a wonderful truth. It's a present truth. This truth about God is the message that will cause people to come out of Babylon. That is the message. And this will be the message given in the loud cry where many will come out of Babylon. Going on, we read, she says about Ezekiel, she says, in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel, is portrayed the fate of the men of responsibility who have not glorified God by faithfulness, God by faithfulness and integrity. She says, read this chapter, but notice especially verses 4 and 6. At the appointed time, the Lord God of Israel will do his work most thoroughly. She said also, study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be, will be literally fulfilled. Yet the time is passing and the people are asleep. They refuse to humble their souls and to be converted. Not a great while longer will the Lord bear with the people who have such great and important truth revealed to them, but who refuse to bring these truths into their individual experience. So what is the problem? Is hearing the truth, but not bringing that truth into your personal life. Can you hear me clear? Okay. So, in context, when I was reading this, I found this also. She said, a great work will be accomplished by the people of God if they will work, how? In unity. What does this mean? Together, Together right? We should not let little things divide us. We should not let anything that is personal or anything that we feel should cause or bring a divide between brothers. Because we plan to live together for how long? Eternity. Eternity. And if we can't do that here, will we be allowed to take the Spirit with us up into heaven? No. No. She says, a great work will be accomplished by the people of God if they will work in unity and unselfishness and with humility of heart. All self-exaltation must be seen and put away. Truth and righteousness alone will stand the test of this time. We need to have the Spirit of God daily with us that we may be kept from all evil thoughts and unwise actions. She says, study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be fulfilled, literally, right? And now, blessed is he that readeth, and he that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And she also said, those who eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God will bring from the books of Daniel and Revelation... Truth that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So now we have three books we have to put together. One is Daniel. She also recommends us to study Revelation. And she also asks us to study Ezekiel. She asks us to study all these, study these deep. And the reason why Revelation to me is, 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 is a book that has allowed me to see what is really going on in the earth and what's happening in our political world and what's happening in the church. It's because of what is recorded and what is studied in the book of Revelation. And that is why we are studying it every Thursday, verse by verse. 
She says, they will start into action forces that cannot be repressed. The lips of children will be open to proclaim the mysteries that have been hidden from the minds of men. Many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession. Every element of power is about to be set to work. Past, this is what we're going to look at today. Today we're going to look at past history will be repeated. We're going to look at also old controversies will arouse to new life. And if you look at Natter uh, study, you will see that one of those old controversies was what? Was what? Worshiping a deity that consisted of three. She says, And peril will beset God's people on every side. Intensity is taking hold of the human family. It is permeating everything upon the earth. Study Revelation in conjunction with Daniel, for history will be repeated. We, with all our religious advantages, ought to know far more than we do know. We should know more. We should know more. I, I don't know how else to say it. Tell you what. Let's take a look. So we are told especially to read Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 4 to 6, right? Now, and the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the forehead of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So what's in the bottom in blue? You'll see. I put up there, what does it say? What is the first phase in Daniel Ezekiel? It's right there. What is the first phase of, the, uh, of Ezekiel? To sealing. The sealing is the first phase. Right? And to the others, which were the men, he said, In mine hearing, go ye after him, after the sealing, through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. So what is the second phase? Judgment. judgment, of course. With judgment comes the sentencing. And what is the sentence right here? To smite. What does it mean to smite? To strike, right? And what does it mean for the person who is getting stricken? To be tormented. Tormented means to be stricken. And then we read, Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man who is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So what is the third phase? What does that word slay mean? Kill. Kill. It means to kill. And according to the spirit of prophecy and according to God's word, if these things are going to be literally fulfilled, there's going to be a sealing, there's going to be tormenting, and then there's going to be killing. We read in chapter 8, And then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way towards the north. So I lifted up mine eyes in the way towards the north, and behold, northward, at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. So, again, going back, and the only reason why I'm going to refer to a lot to Nader's study is, is because he d explains this very thoroughly. And, and uh, I want to, today, just I want to focus on these three things, the sealing, the tormenting, and also, the killing, that's what we have to, because these things are going to be repeated. Okay? So, we read, He said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committed there, or here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations so what is it that caused God to leave his sanctuary? 
What were they worshiping? Yeah, they were worshiping Tammuz, which was a triune god, which consisted of Nimrod, the son, the mother, and and the and the father. So they had all these weird. Uh, well, I'm not. Sh- tell the truth, there's so many uh, uh, Trinity or triune gods back then that um, the son. Anyways, you look at the video. Uh, you will really enjoy it. And verse 7, he says, And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Question, is there any other way into the sanctuary? No, right? But look at what happens when he's given instructions. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig in now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. Don't you find that strange? Why is it that Ezekiel was told to dig in in, from that hole and then he found a door? Why couldn't Ezekiel just go in to the door? That's one of them. It was being done in secret. It was hidden. And this is why this message, the truth about God, when it is just openly given to someone, it is rejected. It is rejected because when I first heard this message, I too rejected it. It wasn't until I began to dig and dig and dig. And when I opened up that door, it was beautiful. But this is not what he saw. You see, we each have to dig up our own treasures from God's word. What I'm sharing with you today, you're probably going to forget by next Sabbath. And I keep saying that. You know, who dug all these verses and notes? That we're sharing today. I did. I went through searching. I mean you have no idea how many hours I spent searching. Researching. Finding. Reading and reading and reading. And and it would get to the point where I had to stop. But I dug all this treasure for myself. And I'm sharing it with you. So it is my experience. And this treasure hunting is something that I did. You have to do for yourself. But. And it won't be as preachy as much as I do, right? Now, will we remember the topic by next Sabbath? Another one. The treasures you must dig for yourself. The Lord knows exactly what truth you need to grasp at this point in your journey with him. And he will show you where to dig. As the Holy Spirit leads you to discover and understand these precious jewels of truth in an experiential way, your soul will rejoice. Unfortunately for Ezekiel, when he digs, he doesn't find any treasure. What did he find? Abominations, right? He finds the abominations, the worship of other gods, and weeping for Tammuz, and much more. We read, Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do have, right? Now, As you describe, and as you look into what Ezekiel saw, he saw all these things. Now, all these things that Ezekiel saw were things that they worshipped back then. Things that that were in Egypt, things that were in Babylon. This is all the things that they had brought in secret, and that they were doing at home, but in front of the people, they did not do these things. Those who seek to remove the old landmarks going to today, this is for us today. This is... What's happening in our sanctuary, in our churches, and this is what's happening in the sanctuary message that is being preached from the pulpit. She says, those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God, she says, or of Christ, are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. So, as you, um, we'll look at this more as we go on. I have a lot of notes here, but because of time, we're going to move on. You see, just to be clear, 
that we are really talking about the spiritual leaders of our church, here's what the spirit of prophecy had to say. She says, the mark of deliverance that has been set upon those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done. She says, now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughtering weapons to whom the command is given. Slay utterly, old, young, both maids, little children, which I know little children always touches our hearts. We want nothing to happen to the children. But speaking of the children, whose responsibility are they? Parents, your responsibilities. So if the children come under this condemnation, whose fault is it? Parents. She says, but come, slay utterly both young, but come not near any man upon whom the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Says the prophet, they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. You see, the work of destruction begins among those who profess to be the spiritual guardians of the people. That's heavy. The false shepherds are the first to fall. There are none to pity or to spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. Now I have a question for you. What we're going to do right now, has there ever been a time where there was a sealing, tormenting, or smite, and slain in history that you know of? We're going to look at that. In Revelation 9, that's why it's so important for us to study Revelation. She said, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star far from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, when we study Revelation 9, most historians know that Revelation 9 is talking about who? It's talking about Islam, right? It's talking about Muhammad. It's talking about the Ottoman Empire. It's talking about their wars. It's talking about everything they did, how they took over and ravished all of Europe. It's history. It's history. It's not my interpretation. It's what history has been recorded and revelation has revealed. She says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose the smoke out of the, out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now this pit, what comes out of this bottomless pit that we're well aware of? Smoke, right? So this smoke that ascended, what did it do? What did it darken? What does the sun give? And what is light? Truth. And what is the air represented as in the Bible? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Even the Holy Spirit was darkened. Right? And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Has anybody ever seen a vast valley of, of, uh, of locusts? And when you see them, what do you think of? Armies. You think of armies, right? Armies. So, whatever religion came out of this bottomless pit, that this teachings darkened the word of God and the Holy Spirit, was powerful enough and religious enough to start armies where? In Europe. Islam. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Hmm. Do you see what took place there? A sealing was taking place. When? This is back already. When this took place, we're looking at the years in the 1400s. Already, there was already a people out there who believed in the truth, who were sealed by God, who by that sealing were protected from who? From those who had the power to smite. Okay? They were told this army had restrictions put on them. You do not come near anyone who had the seal of God. 
And we read, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented. What phase is that? That's the second phase, right? And the time was given how long their torment would last. Five months, and their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And five months is how many years? Prophetic? 150. 150 years. Now, let's continue going on. Now we're going to look at the third phase. We read in Revelation, same chapter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the, from, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. You see, according to Daniel and Revelation, it says that the four angels, these were the four principal sultans of which the Ottoman Empire was composed, located in the country watered by the great river Euphrates. These sultans were situated at Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad. Previously, they had been restrained, the second phase, but God commanded, and they were loosed. What were they loosed to do? They were loosed to kill. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of man. How long was this prophecy supposed to last for all the slain? 391 years, 15 days. 391 years, 15 days did this go on in Europe. And it was done by the Ottoman Empire. Yes, you know, just on a side note, you know that the highest position in Islam is to be the caliphate? It was claimed by the sultan after the defeat of the, Mom, of the Mamluks, which was established as Ottoman Caliphate. The sultan was to be a devout Muslim and was given the literal authority of the caliph. I don't know if you're paying attention, and I don't know if you're watching, but in the streets of the country that I won't name yet, they're walking in the streets and they're calling for a caliphate. What country is this in? United States. That is going on in our streets today. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. By these three was the third part of men killed. They were slain. By fire, and what else? And by the smoke, and what else? And by brimstone, which issued out of their mouth. For their power was in the mouth, and their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. So what were the weapons? Guns, fire, smoke, brimstone. They were killed with weapons of war. The slaying of this judgment came to its end in the year 1840, August 11th. And if I have to tell you what took place then, there was a great awakening in this country. We know it as the... And I cry. The midnight cry. I'm doing this. I'm asking you questions so you can stay awake. Okay? You see, in a comment on Revelation 9, Lich predicted that the Ottoman Empire would lose power in August of 1840. When on August 11th, 1840, the Ottoman Empire accepted guarantees from the great powers they were fighting. Right? It was interpreted as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy and Lich's interpretation thereof. So... We just witnessed the history repeating again, right? Which was a sealing, the smite or tormenting, being tormented, and the slave killing. So, I want to show you something which you probably all should be familiar with. Okay? We should all be very familiar with this. So, very quickly, in Ezekiel, what was the first thing that happened? Sealing. What was the second thing that happened? Smite. And the third thing that happened? Slaying. Killing. Right? 
slain. And the Ottoman Empire, they started first with the sealing. So they were to hurt nobody who had the seal, which meant a sealing took place prior to the command given to smite. And then the killing, right? But take a look at this. So right after the sixth seal of Revelation 6, now, when we do the seals, after the seals of the sixth seal was the end of the Great Tribulation, it was the end of the 2200-year pro uh, prophecy, and Protestant America was already a nation. So we're going to look at this very quickly. Revelation 7.1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the trees, nor on any tree. What phrase is this? It's the third phase. Wait a minute. Is it going to come and do all this work? It's, it's out of sequence, isn't it? She says... And I saw another angel ascending out of the east, having the seal of the living God. Sealing is what? The first phase. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and to the sea. It was, was the second phase, I'm sorry. He said, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed, first phase, the servants of our God in their foreheads. So what were these four angels going to do? They were going to hurt. They were about to hurt. And who were these angels? According to Daniel and Revelation, according to the four corners of the earth, this very same power, which had already smote, tormented, and killed, this power was about to rise up again, already to do its work. What else was happening in 1888? Righteousness by faith was rejected. Yes. What else was going on in 1888? Law. The Blair Bill, Sunday Law in Congress, right? Do you see everything was in motion for what? For the third angel's message to be revealed and fulfilled. But everything was out of sequence, and I'm going to show you why. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed, how many? 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now we're back in sequence. The angel says, wait a minute, you can't hurt anybody. Nobody's sealed. Who's going to be sealed? Who is Israel? What does Romans 2 say? According to Romans 2, 28, it says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outwardly in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one where? Inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. How? In the spirit. And not in the letter. In other words, not physical Israel, not physical Jews, but spiritual Israel and spiritual Israel. Jews, why is that so hard? Why is that so hard for people to see in the world? She says, in the spirit and not in the letter, she sa he said, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So we, back in 1888, were about to see some of the judgments coming upon the earth, but thank God, for this angel that ascended from where? Does anybody know who this angel was? No. No. You. What message did this angel have? What's that? The Sabbath message. He had the Sabbath message. I want to look at something. If you look at this map... In the midnight cry, you see where it's in red? Mm -hmm. Yes, the midnight cry was, did take place mostly in New England, and it took place over in Europe. But was it a worldwide movement? Mm -hmm. We read, the expression, speaking of the third angel, 
or of this angel. It says, the expression evidently refers to a manner rather than locality. For as the sun arises with rays, at first oblique and comparatively powerless, but increases in strength until it shines in all its Mediterranean power and splendor, so the work of this angel, the one that ascends from the east, commences in weakness it moves onward with ever accumulating influence and closes in strength and in power. Amen. So isn't that how the Sabbath message began? The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first and the second angel's message were given. So this angel, we read, did it include the seal of God? Yes, but when the message was given back in 1840 and 1844, was the Sabbath included in it? No. You need to know your history to understand where we are in time and how Ezekiel 8 and 9 is going to be literally fulfilled. The angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God, right? We know that in timeline was what Brother Morgan just said. From 1840 to around 1864. And it was the Sabbath message. And it was the silly message, a worldwide warning. Now I want to read something to you. I don't want you guys to jump ahead, so hold on. Let me, let me do something here that uh, just to... I want to keep your attention very quickly. But going to this, the foundations, and, and when you look online on, on the white estate, there's this, um, they put together these, these uh, uh, writings, and it's called Foundations of the Seventh-day Adventist Message and, and Mission. Under the title, The Concept of Mission, we read this. At, at the last of a series of conferences among Sabbatarian Adventists. How many Adventists were Sabbatarians? Not all of them. There were some. In November of 14, 1848, Ellen White received a vision regarding the proclamation of the sealing message. Are we familiar with that? And the necessity of publishing their newly developed views. Wait a minute. Newly developed views? They were learning they were learning. They were studying. Bates recorded some of the phrases she spoke and published them as part of a publication in January of 1849. According to him, she said that the believers had had the short door and that the time had arrived for the Sabbath as the sealing truth. I'm going to ask you again. When the message, the first and second angel's message was given back in 1840 to 1844 was the Sabbath Included. No, it wasn't. So how could there be a ceiling? That's why the angel proclaimed to the four uh, 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 angels and the four corners. He said, hold on. Until we seal. It says, regarding this truth, she remarked, it commenced from the rising of the sun... The angel that arises, the message, not a personal or a literal angel, but an angel means a messenger, right? It commences from the rising of the sun, keeps on its course like the sun, but it never sets, which seems to imply a reference to a future global influence of the Sabbath. Sabbath. If anybody is watching this video uh, on, online, I'm going to just include this one slide because it's very important for us. You know, it says, from the foregoing reasoning, it is evident that the fourth commandment constitutes the seal of the law of God, or the seal of God. But the scriptures do not leave us without direct testimony on this point. We have seen above that in scripture usage, sign, seal, token, and mark are synonymous terms. But the Lord expressly says that the Sabbath is a sign between him and who? His people. Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout how many generations? All generations, right? We did math this morning. I think there's only, uh, how many? Like 60 generations from the time of Jesus. 
you know, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doeth sanctify you. The same fact is given, the same fact is again stated by the prophet Ezekiel. He says, here the Lord told his people that the very object of their keeping the Sabbath, that is, observing the fourth commandment, was that they might know that he was who? True God. The true God. Can you keep a Sabbath to a three gods? But that's what they're teaching you. That's what they're teaching. This is the same as if the Lord had said, the Sabbath is a seal. On my part, it is the seal of my authority. The sign that I have the right to command obedience. Just like we as parents have the right to go, uh, command obedience from who? From our own children. Yes, we do. And if your children are not obedient, what's going to happen? Read Ezekiel 8 and 9. It says, on your part, it is a token that you are, that you take me to be your God. Now, present day, can we come to today and look at the sealing, the tormenting, and the slain? Let's take a look at it. We read that the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. In what myths are abominations being done today? In the church. In the church. You know, um, we hear a lot and, and, and we get a lot of backlash from people you know, who, who think that we overemphasize the truth about who God is. I used to be one of them. <laughs> that was me. But as I studied it, as I dug more and I dug more and I opened up that door, I realized, Lord, this is the loud cry message. Yeah. And people are trying to silence it. You see, you see the second angel's message, and just like 1840 and 1844, today, as it was rejected then, it is being rejected today. I have a question for you. Is God's church committing the same abominations as did Babylon? The same abominations as did Ezekiel. But I'm not going to say so. I'll let the pen of inspiration let you know. And we read, regarding our pillars, those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God of, or of Christ are working as blind men. Theories and philosophies, what's the difference? It's not true. <laughs> well, it's not truth, right? Theories, at least you could try to make something happen, right? I got a theory, and you do manual things to try to, to make it work. A philosophy... All it is is just speaking vain words, trying to convince somebody that it's true. It's the same thing. And did you know that the Trinity fits both? They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. We read that. But what are the abominations that are done in the midst thereof? I think we've shared this. I'm almost done. We've shared this before, and I'm going to repeat it again, right? Have the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church established a new organization? She says a new movement that Alan White and the pioneers will not recognize, will not support, and will not firmly rebuke. It says that the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in the process of what? Reorganization. 
were this reformation to take place, what would be the result? <laughs> well, the principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded, right? Our religion would be? Thank you. Prophecy, <laughs> I'll say it again, prophecy fulfilled. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as? And I hear that a lot. I don't know if you've heard it, but I hear that all the time. Oh, they didn't know. They, they were learning. They, 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 they worshiped the one true God because they were ignorant. You hear all these stories, you know. What does that say? A new organization would be established. We read books of a new order would be written. We've seen them. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced, the Trinity. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Wait a minute. Do you see that? What do you see? What do you see? The very thing, the very thing that is going to protect you from being tormented or being killed is being done by whom? The church is giving up what? Their seal. Their protection. Their promise. What does it say there? The Sabbath, of course would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. They would place their dependence on human power, which without God is? Are they rejecting the seal of the one true God? What kind of seal can the Trinity God give you? A mark. Very good. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but what's the last one? Has he been removed? Yes. And his place, who have they put? Counterfeit. A counterfeit. Trinity. This has been fulfilled, like Ringling said, and they have rejected the first angel's message along with God's seal. Then it can be said that Babylon has fallen. That being said, the loud cry would be given, and those who have the truth will be given it. But, with a loud cry, which is the truth about who? What does it say what will happen? Revelation 18, 14, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be any partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Plagues and um, was, what happens in Ezekiel 9 are different, Okay. So smite, tormented, in the second phase, we read, their foundation will be built on the sand and storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. So when this second phase begins, what's going to happen to the structure? It's going to be swept away. You see that, you see the four winds bring storm and tempest. And what is the judgment? What is the judgment? Revelation 14.9. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive the mark or his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Brother Morgan just said something very seriously. If you're not worshiping the true God, you're not going to have the seal of his Sabbath. But you're going to have the seal of this false God, which is the mark of the beast. Whose God is on the throne right now? The Trinity. And the Trinity is the foundation of all the church of who? This beast power which gives a mark. Do you see what's happening? Do you see how Ezekiel 9 is today now being literally fulfilled? Is Alan White a prophet? I believe so. I believe so. We read. What's next? And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be what? 
When? After the second coming? Before. Before the second judgment comes. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Smite and tormented. Smite is just one giving it. Tormented is the one receiving it. Second phase. We read, slay. Now we're on to the third phase. And begin where? At the sanctuary. Almost done. You see, according to Ezekiel 18, there will, all, uh, there will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. You see, there is a distinct difference between the seven last plagues and the slaughter of Ezekiel 9. I know many of us think that the last plagues are going to be, the last plagues is a worldwide judgment. What does Ezekiel say to begin it? That's going to be a literal. And the angels in Ezekiel's vision use slaughter weapons and they slay the wicked. But the angels commissioned for the plagues use vials. Right? Now, I want to do this again also. I'm telling you, I was going back and forth and, and I was doing so much. It was like... So... I want to read this to you. So, now we're going back to the third phase. We read here, and to them, going back, remember the angel that arose from the east? Remember it held back the four winds? Do you remember who these armies were that were going to do the, 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 the tormenting and the killing? Who was it? Islam, Islam right? Islam. Now, just so you know, the reason why God allowed Islam to rise and to do what it did, because it was to try to get the apostate church to repent and to come back to the truth. It did it in the first phase where the sealing took place. The Islam went around tormenting Rome. It did it in the second phase. Islam went around tormenting, in the form of the Ottoman Empire, tormenting Rome. Rome. Do you remember the conversations and the letters that went back between um, Martin Luther and the papacy. And some of them were said that, let's come to an agreement. Let's come to a compromise. Why? Because Rome was dealing with the Reformation, and Rome was dealing with who? The killing and the slain of the Ottoman Empire. So remember that, that the Ottoman Empire was a tool that God was using to try to bring his church to repentance but they would not. We read, And to them it was given that they should not kill, but that they should be tormented five months. And the torment was the torment of a scorpion when he has striketh a man. So a tormenting is about to begin. Again, if you're not looking at the news, and if you're not watching what's happening in the streets, and we think these things couldn't happen at home, in the cities, it's happening. It hasn't intensified yet. Let's go to Revelation 9, 15. And the four angels will be loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and for a year for the slay. Now, that's going to happen again. Not the time period, because we have Revelation 10. There is no more time periods, but the second phase will come again. And what does Revelation 18 say? By these were the third part of the men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of whose mouth? This is the loud cry. This is the loud cry message. Do you see the language that is used? The exact very same language that is used which the Ottoman Empire did to do its slain back then. It will be the same power used again today to try to get the church to repent. That's what's happening. Let's continue. What does Revelation 13, 15 say about this power, which is supposed to be Protestant America, which is supposed to be a representation of Protestantism, which protests who? Rome. Rome. But it does not. It's it has joined forces with the world. And this is what it says. 
And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be. What phase is that? A third phase. If you think it's no coincidence that they're trying to get rid of all the monetary system and everything is done electronically, AI is coming in, I mean, we have no idea. I mean, this is where we are. This is where we are. And he, came, and he causes all, both small, great, rich, and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in the right hand and on their foreheads. Right? And that no man might buy or sell, save ye that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So, in closing, I just want to bring this up to you. Remember, you had Ezekiel. You had a ceiling, right? You had a smite, and you had to slay. Then you had the Ottoman Empire, right? The same thing, the three woes, Islam, the ceiling, tormenting, killing. And now we have the three angels' messages, which has what? The same thing. The exact same thing. You have a ceiling. You have tormenting with fire and brimstone. And they will also slay and kill those who have the mark of the beast. And this is the only thing I can tell you. In closing, I'll also say this. Those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a mark by the man in linen, are those that sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the church. Their love for purity and the honor and the glory of the God is such that they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in agony, even sighing and crying. And for you and me, as we grow in our knowledge of the Father and the Son, and as the beautiful truths are unfolded to us by the Holy Spirit of the Son of God, let us never cease to pray for our dear brothers and sisters who are still blinded by Satan. Amen? May we demonstrate the submissive spirit of Jesus in our dealings with the church so that by our lives, if not by our words, Others will catch a glimpse of the true Son of God and will want to know more. Amen. And that is what I gathered. And I could have shared so much more, but time will not allow. Go home and dig for yourselves. Dig for your own understandings. Amen.